I think when we talk about where we are right now, it's important to kind of look at the year we just came through. It was an unusual year from for everybody. Everybody in this room has has been through uh, a tremendous amount of change. We I found out on August fourth that Didi was retiring. Two weeks later, our team was showing up, and I had to get an assistant coach and figure out you know all the COVID policies that we were negotiating our way through with our health people, uh, with Shelly Mullinex and everybody that's in charge over there of how we were going to actually be able to train our kids in a safe environment. And we looked at everything from being able to train them in pods of two with their roommates and being there all day long for 10 or 12 hours a day, bringing them into the building in different waves uh, to eventually getting to where we got and were able to, to manage a training situation. We hired Ashley Nat, who uh, many of you know, who have followed us, who's one of our own who was a national champion on floor, uh, made it clear from the day one that if she ever got the opportunity to coach it at her alma mater, that's what she wanted to do. So she stayed with us as a grad assistant and uh, for a couple of years and then went to Penn State and, and worked. And as timing would have it, when Dee Dee retired, we were able to get her back here. So that was a huge, huge boon for us and also a, a way to maintain the consistency that our kids had come to expect in terms of the environment. What you don't wanna do in these circumstances especially in a, in a pandemic situation was these kids were dealing with things that they had never had to deal with before in terms of restrictions on their lives and those kinds of things. So the last thing we needed to do was to transition our way into something completely unfamiliar to them. And, uh, and so getting Ashley back here was a, was a big part uh, of that. So we negotiated a year that we weren't sure was going to happen. You know, in in, the, in August, we were the, the Southeastern Conference was in, in talks with all of us, and we weren't sure we were going to have a season. And eventually made the decision to go to a conference-only schedule, and we're able to navigate that um, with relatively few interruptions. And I got to say, from a, from a from a coaching standpoint, the SEC is the is the absolute gold standard in terms of uh, thoughtful processes and how to go through this. I know that sometimes they do things that are controversial and they don't handle everything correctly, but I can tell you this, that our commissioner and their, the assistant commissioners worked very closely with us as a, as a, a mi minor sport in the grand scheme of things in their perspective to really make sure that we had a season that our student athletes could enjoy, that they could be proud of. And, uh, and we, we, we did that. We ended up going on to regionals, uh, a new format that we started two years ago. Up until that point, you had six regional sites, NCAA regional sites, and two teams would advance from each regional site out of the six that qualified. We've condensed that to four regional sites with eight teams. So there's a greater concentration of the talented teams, and it's a, it's a two-day format. So it's a, it's a regional and a super regional all in one if you look at it in terms of what baseball deals with. So we we have to qualify from the first day to the second day, and it mimics what we do at the NCAA championships. It's only the second year we've done it, and what it's doing and what it has done is created a greater level of parity and um, and the increased opportunities for upsets and those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a bit of a meat grinder to get to the NCAA championships and get to the final eight. We were able to do that again this year. Very proud of the efforts that our team put forward. We did come up short in the semifinals of advancing to that final four, which is where we want to be year in and year out. But at the same time, felt really good about um, the season as a whole and, and what transpired this year. All five of our seniors this year are returning for their extra year of COVID eligibility. So I can announce that today. That helps us tremendously from a, uh, from a leadership standpoint. They've got a bad taste in their mouth, which is not a bad thing. And they they want to they want to finish this thing uh, strong. So we'll have in a normal year the NCAA allots twelve scholarships for gymnastics this coming year because we don't have to count the returning seniors. Here we'll have seventeen young women on scholarship this year, um, which is going to give us a depth like un unlike anything we've ever seen. So <clears throat> so that's exciting. So we talk about where we're going. So I think when we do that, when we're coming out of this sort of lull in society where everything has kind of stopped and we're getting restarted, even right down to I just found out, you know, you guys just started uh, back the 1st of April being able to do these in-person meetings. I think it's important to reflect on where we were prior to all this starting. And in 2012, I got here with Didi Bro 
um, asking me to come on board and to and to partner with her. And that, to her credit, she treated me as a partner from the get go. Uh, she it would it's unusual when you find somebody who's been in a position for 35 years at that time to be as open and as willing to bring somebody in who might have some new ideas and to kind of conjoin those things uh, with her philosophy that had worked well for so long. But she did that. And, it, and uh, you know, I initially showed up working, wondering if I just needed to kind of bide my time, don't make any waves, don't say anything stupid, and don't get kicked out of the club. You know, that that's kind of the way I was looking at it. But she came in one day and she sat down with me and she said, look, I brought you here for a reason. I want you to talk to me and let's work together on ways that we can do things differently to, to get my program over the hump and where I want it, where I want to see it go. And from that moment on, we, we were arm in arm and uh, never really had a cross day between us. And if you know, Didi, that's, that's unusual, <laughs> but we really didn't. We, we did, we did extremely well together and she treated me like a partner and I'm forever grateful for the opportunity that she gave me to come here. And now to be able to succeed her uh, is a huge honor and, and, and it comes with a lot of expectation, and I embrace that. Um, but we started out in that year where we, you know, there were roughly 500 season ticket holders at the time, and the average attendance was somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000. And we set out with a lot of people involved, and we, we began to try to create a vision for where we wanted to go. And we believed there was no reason that we could not sell out the PMAC in this, in, in this Baton Rouge area, the community of Baton Rouge that has had over 700,000 people in the greater area. And sometimes getting other people to share that vision was difficult because uh, our sport was not one that traditionally had been thought of in, in, in terms of being able to do those things. But we mapped out a plan and we went A, B, C, and D, and we looked at, you know, uh, kind of a calendar of where we wanted to be and how we were going to get there. And we saw that 500 season ticket holders go to 1,200, go to 3,500, go to 6,000. And in 2019, we crossed the 7,000 mark. Uh, for the first time. We saw overall attendance go from that 2,500 to 3,000 to the point where we had had sellouts of over 13,000 uh, on three or four different occasions. But then we're still not there. You know, the idea is that we want to sell that place out every single time. Our demographic is a unique demographic to us. It's not necessarily, there's crossover for sure. There's football fans that come to our meets. There's basketball fans that come to our meets. But the vast majority of our demographic is people who have young children in their families and they want to do something that's quick and concise and entertaining for those kids. Get them in, get them out, get them home at a reasonable price. And once we identified what that demographic was, we were really able to, to see an exponential growth in what we're doing. We also were able to, to qualify to the NCAA finals for five straight years, six straight years uh, it, during that period of time, having the season, having program high finishes. Uh, seven of the eight program high finishes happened in the last nine years. And, and, and so that tells you the trajectory that we've, that we've been on and where we're going. So for next year, where we're, where we're trying to go is, is all encompassing. We want to, we want to retreat. We want to bring our fans home. We feel like this year's theme should be about coming home, coming out of this whole pandemic. Hopefully we don't see any resurgence of anything like that and we can get some things back to normal. We want to see that 7,000 turn into 8,000. We want to see that 11,000 average turn into 13,000. We want to see our team get over the hump and win the national championship for the first time in program history and have that be a celebration for everybody involved, including the 43-year career of my predecessor and friend, Didi Bro, who laid the groundwork and who, who fought so many battles to get our program to where it is today. So when I stand here to you to, with you today, I, you know, I'm, I'm not Didi Bro, and I'm not going to pretend to be Didi Bro. If I walk out there in a, in a sequined jacket or, or, or something along those lines, it's going to real, it's going to be really disingenuous. Um, but I'm not above it for a price. I will tell you that. <clears throat> but, but I want you to know that your program, and I, I look at it in those terms, everybody that's, that's a fan of LSU or everybody that's in the Baton Rouge area, this is your program. This is somebody, something that we're all proud of, with that, the growth that we've seen, but we need continued support from everybody in our community to return it to what it was and then get over the hump and get, 
get it back to a place where we're going to win that thing. And, and, and if it's the last thing I do, we're going to win that thing. And we're going to be able to celebrate another sport that's brought a national championship to Louisiana state university. So with that, I would like to open it up to any questions and, uh, and, and nothing's off limits and I'm sure you've got them and it usually stimulates me. I'm a rambler. So if, if, uh, if I answer your question, um, in a roundabout way, please try to center me again because I do that a lot with recruits too. <clears throat> do you have a position on the athletes earning funds? Uh, I do. Money for the sports? I do. I, I think um, it has changed over the years. Uh, initially, I was against it. Um, when it first started getting talked about, I thought, you know, the scholarship in and of itself is payment, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> But I think if we don't change with the times, whether we like them or not, we're going to get run over. And, and NCAA sports, collegiate sports as we know it, is going to have to change or it will become extinct because the professional sports will eventually make it so enticing that there's no, there's no future for what we're doing, particularly in the revenue sports. So we have a young lady on our team right now who stands to benefit greatly if this thing passes. She has, she's on the top 10 list of social media followers in the world. She's on a list with Serena Williams and people like that. She's in top 10 in the world. She's got over 4 million followers on TikTok. She's got close to two and a half million followers on Instagram. Her name's Olivia Dunn. And I, I, she was a freshman on our team this year. And she's had offers from clothing companies, et cetera, et cetera, that make it not real smart to keep doing what she's doing. Um, she could go to a content house and make several million dollars right now and, and never have to do another thing. So in sports like ours, that's a rarity. But if we don't provide an avenue for that, we're eliminating a significant portion of our talent pool uh, because of the way things have gone in social media. So I'm 100% for it. I think, I think Louisiana has an opportunity right now with what's going on down at the legislature to get ahead of it a little bit. Because I feel like what's going to happen is the NCAA is going to kick it to Congress. And when it goes to Congress, it's going to sit. And those states who have something in place will be at an advantage. Those universities, from our perspective, will be at an advantage because the state law will rule the day at that time. Florida already has one. Texas already has one. Utah already has one. We need one. Um, because we, we need to be able to take advantage of that the same way that, uh, that a lot of these other states are going to do it. And they're going to use it against us if we don't. So uh, basketball has a similar situation. Shaquille's son is, is, is on the team, and from a social media perspective, he is the, the highest collegiate athlete, uh, male or female, in terms of followings on social media. The, the doors that social media opens for these kids now is crazy, and it's something that I don't clearly understand top to bottom. But I know that if we don't if we don't help facilitate it, we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. Yes, sir. Uh, Renee Shadowman was wondering uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the SEC being so competitive, as you mentioned, you had all five of your seniors returning. Mm -hmm. Do you know how the other schools in the SEC? I, yeah, I don't think. Um, I know they all have uh, at least a portion of their classes coming back. They've been real. We just got off this morning. We had our SEC head coaches meeting. Nobody's really saying. Um, <clears throat> I proudly proclaimed all five of mine were coming back. So I assume that since they didn't do the same, that not all of theirs are coming back. But but uh, uh, or maybe they don't want them to. I, I, I can tell you, I want our I want our kids to come back. The character that our kids have, uh, you know, I know they're frustrated with how they did on the final event. Um, the last rotation, you know, if you'd have told me we'd have had a 99 one halfway through that meet and that would somehow we weren't going to advance, I wouldn't have believed you because we were on fire for three events. And then, so I know, and it was the seniors that, you know, had some mistakes. And I think they, they, their character has been so great their entire time here. Uh, they adjusted to me taking over. They adjusted to COVID. They led the freshmen through that. And I'm talking about categorical changes in the way that they had to live their lives. And, and they did it without complaining and they did it the right way. They weren't sneaking off and going off places and doing and going to the parties and doing the things they were uh, asked not to do. So I'm proud of them and I want them back. And I, I, I don't know who's coming back from the other teams, um, but I don't think it'll be as impactful as it will be for us. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it. 
you mentioned that you uh, identified the target of families with children that wanted to be fishing mm -hmm. fun activity. Can you talk about how you attracted them to consider the program and you know, the marketing or what went into actually converting yeah. them to the yeah, so I, I think that there's a lot of moving parts to that. But one of the once we once we figured out kind of what our demographic was, um, and that's a moving target. We've got to we've got to reexamine that periodically um, in terms of mailing lists and things of that nature. But I think we had a little bit of an awareness issue um, initially. Uh, there were there were people that um, that were in the community that just really didn't know we had a gymnastics program. And once we were able to, to, to target that, um, at the time in the marketing department, there were mail outs that were going out in the fall and they were going to our season ticket holders, which as I mentioned, was about 500 people at that time. But really there was not much effort to, to try outside of Dee Dee herself, getting her team out there and beating the bushes and doing the things you can do publicly didn't have those things. So what we did is uh, Mike Smith, who is a member of this club, I believe, um, I worked with him to generate a mailing list uh, based on a, demog a target demographic within certain zip codes and on and on and on. And we and 20,000 people got a, got a flyer in October just to start creating an awareness. And that's when we began to see um, some of those things begin to turn. I think more than anything, it's about it's about keeping a steady diet for the public. So many programs in our sport lose it in the summer and in the fall when there's not they're not actually competing. And I think one of the things we've improved upon over the years is keeping a steady diet, a little bit of exposure, little things going out, whether that be social media, uh, advertising around town, whether it be billboards, things that are going on community service things that we try to involve ourselves with year round. And we build that calendar. So there's a piece of all of those components that is going on year round. And so as that can, it kind of snowballs and it begins to build over time. And I'm not a marketing person, but I've been around a lot of really good people that know what they're doing. And, um, and that, that seems to work a great deal for us. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's kind of a mixed bag there. Sarah Finnegan was on our team. I guess she finished up two, two full years ago. Um, she was on the, uh, she was an alternate for the Olympic team. Ruby Harrell was on the 2016 Olympic team, but they trained at their clubs and then came to college. You're beginning to see a, a little bit of a shift, um, just with so many things that have gone on in our sport, both positively and negatively, you're beginning to see an older athlete begin to be um, peak a little bit later and be able to go back to the Olympic level as they go into college. So it's going to, I think you're going to see that shift. I think you'll see more of the Olympians coming out of the college programs versus going to the Olympic games and then going to college to finish their careers. I think that's beginning to move right now. Coach, uh, Sammy Randy recovered from her injury. Yeah. And how do you feel about becoming freshman? Hmm. Two very good subjects. Sammy Durani, <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of her story real quick because I, I think it's important to contextualize this. Sammy Durani's mother followed me at Georgia, was the head coach, got dismissed. Her daughter was to go to Georgia with her mother the following year. There, there was no love loss between her mother and I, for a lot of reasons at the time, and and her mother and and they dis and the, the the new coach dismissed her with a text and said it's just best that you don't join us. So the kids' dreams are gone. I mean, she's like, I'm doing this. This is going to be the greatest time of my life. Boom, it's over. Her mom reaches out to me at 11:30 one night. We probably had three conversations in the entire 20 years I've known her, and said. I, if anybody knows where she would have an opportunity to go, it would be you. And I said, give me a day to think on it and I'll see if I can reach out to some people and find some opportunities. And then in the course of having a cup of coffee the next morning, I went here. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I called her back and I said, look, I don't have my, we don't have any scholarship money, but if she does what I think she'll do, I can pretty much tell you that she'll wind up on some money if you'll give us a chance to do it. She came here as a walk on, on a leap of faith, um, not thinking she would have to ever pay for college and uh, 
came in and that kid, she's quiet, she's unassuming, but she is exactly the same every single day of her life. It, it was gut wrenching to her to make that mistake and to have her arm slip and pop her elbow the way that it did. Uh, the short answer is her injuries are going to be fine. She, uh, she'll be back full force. We're not real sure what's going on in there structurally. It doesn't appear to be anything serious, but we're still going. But that kid had been more to team over the last four years than any, than any press clippings. That, that, that whole senior class, they don't get the press clippings because they're not all-arounders. They're not, they're not the kids doing all four events and, and, and getting the big-time the big headlines and those things. But that kid in particular – is one of the greatest, um, amazing competitors and people that I've ever been around in 30 plus years of doing this. And she is, I said this on the radio one time, they asked me to characterize if they, did we have a killer on the team? And I went, yeah, we got one. And she will stab you in the neck and smile at you while she's doing it. And that, <laughs> and that, <laughs> that sort of caught people off guard when I said it that way, but metaphorically speaking, of course. So, um, um, but yeah, she's doing well. And the second part of your question was, yeah. So, so I mentioned Sarah Finnegan before her little sister will be joining us this fall. And from a physical standpoint, Aaliyah Finnegan is, uh, more talented than her sister. Um, it remains to be seen if she's still, if she's that kind of competitor up here, but she will be here. She plans to be at Olympic trials this summer, which kind of goes back to your question, sir, about the, the, uh, uh, the Olympic connection. She will probably make Olympic trials. Uh, you know, we'll see where that goes from there. Um, selfishly, we want her to be here in the fall, but if she makes the Olympics and has to wait and join us in January, then that's that's the way we'll go. Um, Caitlin Johnson is another one uh, from Texas Dreams, which is where we've had several. Kaya Johnson's from there. Um, uh, Lamencia Hall was from there. Um, Reagan Campbell, who's on our team, is also from there. Um, they're very consistent, very powerful, excellent gymnast. Caitlin uh, just had a, an excellent regional meet, won her regional meet in her age category. Um, and then another one, Tori Tatum from Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, who's a former United States elite national team member as well. Um, she's, she's, they're, they're all three difference makers. And so the, the hard part for me with the five seniors coming back and then bringing that additional three in this year, from a talent perspective, we're going to be deep and keeping them happy. That's a lot of mouths to feed, and 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 you've got to you got to keep them happy. You got to keep them happy because they all want to compete. And so we're going to have. We've talked about it as a coaching staff. We're going to have to be very diligent in making sure that they understand why we make lineup decisions that we make. Because if we if we miss something, because they're always watching. They know what they score. They know how well they're doing in practice, and they know those things. So we've just got to make sure that we handle it right. We've already addressed it with the returning seniors that that they need may need to understand that while in some ways we're going to depend heavily on them, in other ways we got to let these kids grow into their leadership roles too, who have been behind them. So there's got to be kind of a melding of the minds there. This is an unusual circumstance for us, but. From a talent perspective, we're very excited. Now, it's probably – most people will probably rank it as the third or fourth best class in the country coming in behind UCLA, Florida, and Utah. Um, but I wouldn't trade any of the ones we got coming in for any of those kids. So I'm, I'm excited about what we got coming in. Yes, sir. Um, you kind of answered my question just then, but out of curiosity, I'm hearing this about other sports. What's the challenge around recruiting and keeping kids related to seniors returning? If I think I'm going to be next in line, a senior stays, are you finding it a challenge with kids maybe transferring out or going to um, Not for us. Um, I, I've, I'm hearing some of that, you know, and I hear that from other sports and I hear it. I actually hear it from other coaches around the country. I think something that we've done a, a good job of building around here for the at least during the time that I've been here, um, is, is we have such a good culture within our team. They are as invested in each other as they are in anything. And um, there's not a lot of jealousy. We create competitive environments, but uh, we spend a lot of time talking about who we are, what we stand for. Uh, we spend a lot of time forcing them to communicate with each other, to avoid things that are going on behind the scenes. And you, you wind up with division and clicks and those kinds of things. I wouldn't say we're perfect at it, but I would say for the most part, we've, we've done a good job of, and they've done a good job of buying into that. You know, that long gone are the days where coach can walk in, pound their fist and say, 
my way or the highway. It's not, it's, it's not that way anymore. 18 to 22 year old student athletes, they want to know why you do something. And, and honestly, if we can get them to understand why we're doing it and they buy into it and they've got ownership in it, we avoid a lot of those problems. So we've got systems that are in place that force them to talk to each other instead of about each other. We've got systems that are in place that recognize each of them for their small achievements that may not show up on a score sheet. They may not show up in a newspaper article, but we see it and, and weekly we give those awards out and we recognize things from an academic standpoint, from the way they're training, from the way they've treated each other. We've seen things go on as teammates and the relationships that they have. And we try to recognize those things. And one story about that that stands out to me more than others um, we had a young lady several years ago that struggled academically on the team. And, and when we would give these awards out, there was, you know, we'd go through the academic portion. She never got one, never, I mean, three years, never again. It became to a kind of thing where I'm like, do we need to restructure this? Because it's kind of exposing someone and making them feel worse than the, the intent was designed to do. I'm telling you one day she got it. She got an A on an exam. And when we made that announcement, there wasn't a dry eye in the room and every single kid was stood up and clapped and went nuts. And so we've created a culture where they're so invested and so in tune to each other. We haven't had any of those kinds of issues arise. We just found out today that they're not coming back this year. They're going to, because the rotation was already broken from the canceled year, the year before. So we're going to Birmingham this year. Lovely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> love that place. Uh, and then we go back to Atlanta because that was on the docket already. And that one got pushed back. So it comes back to New Orleans in 2024 in the Smoothie King Arena, assuming we can create the groundswell of support that we had for it last time. It's not it. That's what's been recommended so far. So a lot of it's going to depend on the sports commission and making sure that LSU and our community, our fan base can get behind it and they can, because there's guarantees involved and the conference won't put it places where, where you can't, where you can't meet those guarantees. One of the things that I'm hopeful is that the, the what happened in New Orleans a couple of years ago, once we got into an NBA arena, now I realize New Orleans is New Orleans and LSU people are LSU people. Not everybody understands that. It's different. But I hope it's an example of the fact that we can grow this thing and we can start thinking about getting it into the NBA arenas. And I want New Orleans to be on that rotation. I think there should be three of them. I think it should be Atlanta, in State Farm, not up in Duluth at that Gwinnett thing that's up there. I think it should be Orlando because that's close proximity to Florida. Ours is close proximity to us, and Atlanta is a is a is a destination city of of sorts as well. And I think we should put it on a three three city rotation and get a pattern going with those three. You've been at other schools. How do the facilities that you have compare to LSU versus When I got here nine years ago, we had the worst in the conference. It wasn't even close. It now is the best in the world. I mean, the one we built and have been in here five years. It's it's unbelievable. We are so blessed. And 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 uh, when I got here, the money had or this was part of the stadium. Probably remember when they expanded the stadium and put the video boards up in the end zone and and did that part of the part of that allocation. The money that the Board of Regents had approved was stadium. And then there was 10 million for gymnastics and 10 million for tennis. Um, <clears throat> we were a little concerned at the time that it wasn't didn't seem that our facility was on a timetable. And I had been through another situation where you have this big project and you have these other things allocated and sometimes they're used to cover overruns on the bigger part of the project and the other part never really comes about. Um, so Didi and, and I began to try to garner support with the Board of Supervisors and everything to make sure that we could get this done. And, and, and in addition to that, we were able to raise several million more dollars um, to, uh, to, to make it as grand as it is. And I'm telling you, if you have not been to our facility, please come. You can come to practice. Hopefully we're going to be back to normal. Our practices are open to the public. You want to come to our practice, you can sit in the balcony, watch us train and see what we do on a day in and day out basis. Our kids do better when there's people watching, trust me. And, and, 
And so you're, you're welcome to come there. Come there anytime. Come see this place. It is absolutely phenomenal. It is the light that draws the flies for us in recruiting right now. It is, it is the thing that, that gets them down here from Canada when they never thought they would look at the Deep South. It's the thing that gets them from California when they, they thought they were just going to stay at one of the great options that's out west. We're able to get them here, and if I can get them on campus, I promise you I've got about an 80% chance of getting them.